Recording started. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our webinar, After the Diagnosis of Alzheimer's Disease, Preparing the Patient and Caregivers. This conference is being recorded. My name is Jesse Mickluck, and I'm with the Lewin Group. This is the second webinar in the 2016 series, Geriatric Competent Care, Caring for Individuals with Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dementias. Today's webinar is titled, After the Diagnosis of Alzheimer's Disease, Preparing the Patient and Caregivers. This series is presented in conjunction with Community Catalyst and the Lewin Group and supported through the Medicare Medicaid Coordination Office at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Continuing medical education and continuing education credit is available for today's webinar from the American Geriatric Society and the National Association for Social Workers. In order to receive credit, please complete the pretest that is located on the right-hand side of your screen by 12.20 p.m. Eastern Time, participate in today's webinar, complete the post-test with a score of at least 80%, and complete the program evaluation form. CME and CE certificates will be emailed approximately four to eight weeks after this event. MMCO is developing technical assistance and actionable item tools based on successful innovations and care models, such as this webinar series. To learn more about current efforts and resources, please visit our website, www.resourcesforintegratedcare.com for more details. All the Q&As and the slides from today's presentation, as well as the recording, will be posted on that website. Please contact rick at lewin.com, that's R-I-C at L-E-W-I-N dot com, if you have any questions or additional comments. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you all that all microphones will be muted throughout the presentation. However, there will be a brief question and answer period at the end of this presentation. If you do have a question, please use the Q&A feature on the WebEx to submit that question at any time during today's event. At this time, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Renee Marcus Hoden. Renee is the Deputy Director of the Center for Consumer Engagement and Health Innovation at Community Catalyst, a national consumer advocacy organization based in Boston. In her current role, she works to establish a powerful and effective consumer voice at all levels of the healthcare system in order to make it more responsive to patients and families, particularly those who are the most vulnerable. Renee has been at Community Catalyst since 1998, where she has built expertise on a variety of healthcare issues, including systems of care for dual eligibles, prescription drugs, hospital free care, and community benefits and healthcare conversion. Renee? Thank you, Jesse. I'm so pleased to be with you all today, and I'm so pleased to know that there's continued interest in this topic. Um, as Jesse noticed, as Jesse noted, I'm with the Center for Consumer Engagement and Health Innovation. Um, the center is a hub devoted to teaching, learning, and sharing knowledge to bring the consumer experience to the forefront of health. Um, as Jesse mentioned, the center is part of Community Catalyst. We're out of Boston, Massachusetts, and we can be found on the web at healthinnovation.org or on Twitter at CCEHI. We'll get, we're going to be live tweeting during this webinar, so we hope that you might check out our Twitter handle, and please just join in the conversation as you choose. We'll be on Twitter also after the webinar to answer questions and point people in the direction of good resources. Once again, our handle is at CCEHI. -C -C -E Next slide, please. Great. 
So we've got a really rich set of presentations today. Um, these were developed with colleagues at the American Geriatric Society, the Lewin Group, and as Jesse noted, the Medicare Medicaid Coordination Office. Um, because it's a very full set of presentations, I'm going to just jump right in and introduce our three pretty geographically diverse speakers to you. Next slide, please. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. Robert Schreiber. Dr. Schreiber is my fellow New Englander on today's webinar. He's the Medical Director of Evidence-Based Programs at the Hebrew Senior Life Department of Medicine in Boston. Rob also serves as the Medical Director of the Healthy Living Center of Excellence and is a Clinical Instructor of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School. Our second speaker is going to be Dr. Lisa Gwyther. Dr. Gwyther is our representative from the South today. She joins us from Duke University, where she's an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and the director of the Alzheimer's Family Support Program for the Center of the Study, for the study of Aging and Human Development. Our third speaker today is Dr. Deborah Cherry. Dr. Cherry is our West Coast representative. She is a clinical psychologist and is currently serving as the executive vice president of Alzheimer's Greater Los Angeles. Please note that all three speakers' full bios will be posted on the Resources for Integrated Care website after the webinar, so you can look at their longer uh, biographies and illustrious careers. Next slide, please. Terrific. Before I turn things over to the speakers, I just wanted to give all participants a sense of the agenda for this call. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Dr. Schreiber, um, preparing the patients and caregiver, preparing the patient and caregivers. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Gwyther on working with families after the diagnosis, and we'll conclude the presentations with Dr. Cherry discussing the Dementia Cal MediConnect project. After that, we're going to have a robust Q&A session, and then a survey, and then the post-test. Next slide, please. One last thing, I just want to quickly cover the learning objectives for the webinar. Upon completion of this webinar, participants will be able to do three things. First, they'll be able to identify common reactions to a diagnosis of dementia. Second, they'll be prepared to assess family needs and provide guidance around the varying roles families may perform as caregivers, whether that's coordinating care, providing direct care, or offering long-distance support. And finally, they'll be able to display knowledge of teamwork and strategies needed to help patients and families of different backgrounds access home and community-based resources. Next slide, please. So now I'd like to hand things over to Dr. Schreiber to get us started. Dr. Schreiber? Thank you, Renee. Um, I appreciate this opportunity. I'm really excited about having the uh, chance to talk about the importance of preparing the patient and caregivers. Can I have the next slide, please? So what we're going to do in this uh, part of the presentation, I'm going to talk first about confirming the diagnosis. This is what happens after the diagnosis, but it's important to first confirm it, then uh, identify the stage where people um, may be at, understanding goals and values of the individual and the family and caregivers, um, then talking about education, medication, and ongoing support. Next slide, please. So in terms of the first thing to do, we will have people come back in after the diagnosis has been made, and one of the things that oftentimes occurs is that people may not have heard the message. So they'll often ask, is this Alzheimer's disease? Is there something else that can be causing this? So it's really important to review what has been stated, make certain people understand what they're dealing with, um, specifically the patient and or family, and make certain if there is um, concerns, that those concerns at least get put out on the table. We also need to understand what does this mean to the person and family. Oftentimes we just go right into, well, what are we going to do about it? But again, this is a fairly significant diagnosis. It is going to change not only the individual, but the family's uh, life and others that they deal with. So it's important to understand from their perspective, what does that, what do, does it mean now? And then always keep checking in about what does it mean as time goes on. Then it's also important for them to understand the diagnosis. As we know, Alzheimer's disease is progressive. 
Um, there is no cure for it, and um, the opportunity of how to live your best possible life needs to be stressed, but really understanding that this is going to be a that's going to continue to challenge. And then lastly, having education about dementia. You know, have they had education and what we find oftentimes they have not, and understanding really what the different stages and course of the disease will be um, are really important aspects of what the primary care provider needs to do. Next slide, please. So in terms of the stages, of Alzheimer's disease, um, there are three specific stages that I'd like to cover. The first is the early stage, and this is in particular where we find people have difficulty with amnesia, actually rapidly forgetting information, not knowing necessarily what they did in the morning, what they ate. You know, there's significant changes in memory. Oftentimes, they have difficulty in doing tasks that were fairly complex in their lives, things that they would normally do, an attorney can no longer you know, do um, the uh, counseling that they do. They can't do the paperwork. They oftentimes can have impaired judgment or problem-solving ability difficulties. Oftentimes, there's intrusion areas in anomia, which is really like the word, a word anomia is really a problem with word finding. They oftentimes will not have impairment of understanding what's being said, but they'll have difficulty finding the right word, so they'll use other words to get to what they're trying to, uh, to define. Oftentimes, they'll have visual spatial difficulties, so they can see images, but the perception of the size and location in their surroundings is oftentimes impaired. And then we see mood disorder. Uh, people can get depressed, they can get anxious, they can get um, introverted, um, their personalities change. And uh, this can be very subtle, but nevertheless significant. Then as we go, and that stage in general is approximately three years, and oftentimes early stages can be missed or may not be diagnosed early on because a lot of these are subtle. And then we go into the middle stage where we see significant progression of memory loss. Uh, people have difficulty uh, with speaking and understanding fluent aphasia. They can speak very fluently, but they oftentimes do not understand or can express themselves. Um, and then they have difficulty with circumlocutions, which is really the use of many words when fewer would do. So they can't really find the word or the concept, and they oftentimes will go into a very significant discussion about what they're trying to emote. Then there's semantic paraphasias, which are unintended syllables or words or phrases that oftentimes are associated with aphasias. We see continued progression of executive dysfunction and visual spatial difficulties. And then there's apraxia, which is the inability to perform particular purposeful actions, and agnosia, the inability to interpret and process sensory information. Lastly, we see um, people having functional decline, and then behavioral problems can also start occurring. And again, this is not very subtle, and it oftentimes impacts um, the family and individual's ability to really um, be involved in social environments. Next slide. We have a picture here of the first person who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in the late 1890s, her name is August Dieter, and she was found as to have a fairly rapid progression, um, and this is her at her later stage of Alzheimer's disease. This is where we find severe memory compromise, severe functional impairment, and loss of activities of daily living. Um, people are unable to bathe, they need help with transferring, difficulty eating, you know, the basic um, functions that people need to be able to stay independent. Oftentimes they have speech, and the speech is often uh, limited by echolalia, where there's meaningless repetition of another person's spoken words. They just are literally like an echo chamber. Uh, we can see bradykinesia, which is slower uh, movements. There's rigidity and difficulty with gait. And lastly, we can oftentimes see behavioral disturbances. And as you can see, behaviors become a significant issue. Next slide, please. 
In terms of goals of treatment, we need to understand really what matters to the individual and family. And this is the importance of having this diagnosis and dealing with it early on. What do people want to focus on? And oftentimes it's quality of life and function. We also need to make certain that the patient and family have the appropriate ed education and that the caregivers who may be or not be family members understand the disease and how to manage it. We want to maintain and, if possible, improve cognition, manage comorbidities in particular, which we'll talk more about. Behaviors, again, become an issue and how we deal with that, and then develop and work with an interdisciplinary team. Next slide, please. So in terms of education of the family and caregiver, oftentimes it's lacking. Um, and what I mean about that is that people, we oftentimes assume a patient and family understand this, even though there is internet access and there's a lot of information out there. In terms of actually understanding how that applies to an individual, we oftentimes um, assume and we shouldn't. So we need a standardized approach. And really, who's going to do that? It oftentimes uh, needs to be comprehensive. There needs to be a lot of time spent. And then what's going to be covered, the topics, referrals to services, materials? Where are people in the phase? Are they still having a difficult time accepting this? Are they depressed about it? You know, where in the, the phase of understanding are they and how do we help them move through the process to get to a care plan that's meaningful? Um, the primary care physician actually needs to develop, if he doesn't have one or she doesn't have one, an interdisciplinary team with expertise. Care managers, or you know, oftentimes are nurses, but can be social workers, and specifically not only in practices, but in community-based organizations, which I'll talk more about. Um, the Alzheimer's Association has been a tremendous um, opportunity for practices to work with. So connecting with a, a team at the Alzheimer's Association where you can do virtual consults, where they will call an individual and counsel them and or their family members about the disease and what to expect. And then developing an ongoing support network. Support groups, families, friends, faith-based organizations are really critical. Next slide, please. So in terms of treatment, there are two types of medications. The, the first medication is acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, and there are particularly three types, uh, denepazil, galantamine, and ribostigmine. And the way these medications work is, as you can see in the cartoon, acetylcholine is a transmitter between the neurons of the brain, and acetylcholinesterase breaks down the acetylcholine, and as we lose neurons, transmitting neurons, because of the disease, the amount of acetylcholine is lessened, and so as it breaks down, the function decreases. These medications are inhibiting the breakdown of acetylcholine. The next uh, medication is a uh, memantine, and it works on a different pathway called a glutamate pathway. Can we have the next slide? The glutamate pathway is very important in terms of uh, being a neurotransmitter in the brain. It's involved in learning and memory. And what we see in Alzheimer's disease is excess glutamate is oftentimes released from damaged cells from the Alzheimer's disease. And this can cause uh, cell damage, not only um, in the presynaptic but in the postsynaptic uh, area. The mechanism of action, this medication actually um, takes away and blocks the impact of this excess glutamate on the neuron, the postsynaptic neuron, and allows restoration of physiological signal, signal transmission. So again, this oftentimes is used mostly in moderate and later phase disease, um, where it seems to be most effective, if it is going to be effective. Next slide, please. So we do have medications, but Unfortunately, there is no evidence that shows that the medication slows the underlying disease process in patients with Alzheimer's disease. There is evidence, however, that at least a third and could be more of patients may see some benefit with functional improvement and or behavior changes. So it's not unreasonable to try these medications, but if there is not significant benefit or changes that are seen, 
by the family and or the clinician, oftentimes these may be limited for, you know, several months or up to a year, depending on how people are doing. But they are being utilized, um, but again, there just is no medication at this point that has been able to slow down the progression or prevent the progression of the disease. Next slide, please. So then I want to talk about um, what can we actually do. So, you know, this is unfortunate that we have medicines that really aren't going to pre prevent the progression of the disease, but what can we do? And there are things that can be done. We know that healthy behaviors can be emphasized by the primary care provider, and this can make a difference and this can slow down the disease because we know if chronic diseases are not controlled, this will worsen and hasten the progression of the Alzheimer's disease. We know that physical activity makes a significant difference, and there is some evidence that it can be preventive for Alzheimer's as well as mitigate the progression of it if people are really engaged. Proper nutrition and mental stimulation are critically important. Again, healthy behaviors that improve mood and keep people feeling that they have a sense of purpose and socialization where they're valued and they have meaning in their lives, all can make a difference in terms of the way people's quality of life is and the way they function and the impact that has on the family caregiving unit. And lastly, ensuring people have good sleep hygiene. Um, I don't know about you, but if I have a poor night's sleep, I have significant cognitive issues the next day. Could you just imagine somebody with Alzheimer's disease who, and we know sleep is a major issue in this population, what happens? So again, promoting good sleep and all the above items make a difference in that. Next slide, please. I want to talk next about the caregivers. So we talked about what we can do as an individual patient and what we can help promote, but the critical role of caregivers, and we're going to hear a lot more about that from my colleagues. But specifically, we know that dementia caregiving is associated with high emotional strain, poor physical health outcomes, and increased mortality. Um, there are a number of assessments that can be done. The American Medical Association has a caregiver self-assessment questionnaire, as well as the Alzheimer's disease has a caregiver stress check um, assessment that actually gives useful um, things that can be done as a result of the particular stressor. It's important that primary care providers routinely identify beneficiaries or their patients who are family caregivers as part of their health risk assessment in the annual wellness exam. So I actually ask that, are you a caregiver and you know, how, are you, how is that going? So tracking this person's health status and again, knowing there's risks from dementia caregiving is really important. And also monitoring their health status, whether they're coming in as patients or if they're with their loved ones are really important. And lastly, it's important for the caregivers to develop a plan B. What I mean by that is something happens, what are you going to do if you're not able to manage and take care of your loved one? What's the plan to fill in the gaps while you're recovering or you're ill? Next slide, please. There needs to be ongoing support, oh, okay, in terms of, oh, okay. So the next thing is, we talked about the caregiver, but what can the primary care physician do in terms of helping the caregiver and the individual? So there's a number of community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, senior centers, support groups out there. But in particular, in many areas where there are area agencies on aging that provide long-term service supports, they can come into the home and can actually help do some counseling and give information to the, uh, the family unit and the individual about what's available in the area. They can do a financial needs assessment and see if these people qualify or the family and the individual qualifies for additional supports. And there's a website for the National Association of Agencies on Aging that can actually direct you to your local um, area agency if you don't know of that. There's also opportunities through um, these long-term service support organizations to help, like I said, get some home supervision potentially if people qualify financially. 
There's adult daycare programs, Meals on Wheels, transportation, there are management services and monitoring that are going on. And there's also support for the caregiver and other types of environmental supports. And lastly, in many states, there is now programs that where the money follows the person. So even if somebody is nursing home eligible, they can stay in the community because the money can be channeled to provide community support. Next slide, please. So in terms of ongoing um, um, support, oh, next, next slide. Is that it? Okay, I don't think, okay, yep, go back, sorry. All right, so we talked about um, support groups in particular um, previously, but I do want to talk that there are educational programs that can be done through health systems, um, area agencies on aging, or the Alzheimer's Association. And in Massachusetts, there's a couple called Coping with Memory Loss and Caregiver Support Series, and I think many states have similar programs. There's also evidence-based programs called Powerful Tool for Caregivers, and there is the 24-7 hour, hour hotline for the Alzheimer's Association, which many of my patients and families will use uh, for support. So it doesn't matter time of day. If there are issues or challenges, there is somebody there who's informed who can help families get through a crisis, a behavioral issue, or some other type of concern they have. And then it's also important to have the interdisciplinary team counsel for alternative housing arrangements as the disease progresses. Next slide, please. So in terms of ongoing management, it's really important as we put this all in place and a care plan is being developed to have regular visits. I try to meet quarterly with individuals every three to four months. It's important to have the interdisciplinary team provide social support, the care managers, um, people that are involved with the, the caregivers, that they're able to get the support they need to help the individual. It's important to also checking in on how people are sleeping. And again, we talked about the caregiver check-in. Uh, goals of care need to be updated so that as the disease progresses, people's focuses oftentimes and their values don't really change, but their goals of care may. And so it's important to understand where people are in terms of advanced directives, as well as in terms of what they want to accomplish. It's really important to prevent adverse drug events. Over-the-counter medications can really interact with um, other medications as well as have side effects and specifically those drugs that cause anticholinergic impact, like allergy meds, anxiolytics, antidepressants, and uh, medicines that are used for urinary frequency and incontinence can all have impact. So it's really important to prevent these drug reactions and before medicines are started to check in with the primary doc. We want to avoid hospitalizations because delirium can result. And so using urgent care and trying to avoid emergency departments are really critical. Next, please. So in terms of treatment of behaviors, we know that behaviors will occur. Um, in early stages, uh, we see behavior and personality changes, such as irritability, anxiety, and depression. But in later stages, we see other types of symptoms. And these don't always happen. Um, they, you know, you may have one, you may have another, or you may have all of them, just depending on the circumstances. But anything from anger, agitation, aggression, emotional distress, physical or verbal outbursts, restlessness and pacing, hallucinations or sleep disorders, these are all symptoms of behaviors that occur in various stages at various times. And the point is that in almost all cases, there are treatments. Oftentimes non-pharmacologic, but if they are needed, small doses of medications, antidepressants, um, uh, as well as uh, antipsychotic medications for those that are severely agitated or aggressive can make a significant difference. Last slide, please. So in summary, it's really important for the primary care practitioner to collaborate with the interdisciplinary team um, and develop their interdisciplinary team. We need to understand individuals' values and goals. 
We need to make certain that the education and healthy behaviors and community supports are a critical component of the care plan to allow for effective treatment of the disease. Medications, as I noted, can, are, can be important adjuncts but will not change the disease trajectory. Uh, behaviors should be expected and a plan for treatment uh, will be necessary. I think there is a following webinar that will be dealing with this issue in particular. And lastly, the caregiver support um, is critically uh, essential and necessary to have the best possible outcome. Thank you, and I'll turn this over to our next speaker, Lisa Bleicher. Thank you, Rob, and I'll go to the next um, slide, please. Though I'm a social worker and I deal primarily with families, I believe we should start from the perspective of the person with the disease. Uh, this one man was a musician, a locally famous musician, who wanted to be treated just like normal. Alzheimer's wasn't his whole life. But part of what we do in working with families is helping them help the person maintain familiar valued identities. And as I talked with one man recently who said all he wondered was why can't things be easy like they used to be when he was chairman of his department. Next slide, please. Another professor of history said, I get tired of asking when and what is going to happen just as families get tired of repeating the same answers to the same questions over and over again. But people with Alzheimer's want to be included part of something, and they want to be acknowledged that this can hurt a lot and be very frustrating experience for them. Next slide. What are some of the things families say? I think the critical thing families say is there never seems to be enough of me or enough of the quality, affordable help I need. And then families get frustrated when people offhandedly say, Oh, they tell me to take care of myself. Well, yeah, right, how can I do that with all the increasing responsibilities I've taken over from the person who's impaired? Many families talk about losing a sense of identity, particularly as a couple, or looking for a technological simple fix for a very complex disease. And that was the woman who said, I need a Charlie app. Um, Many daughters talk about, I'm proud to be a caregiver, but it's something I do, not who I am, and helping them retain that sense of being a daughter and also being a professional and having time and having the right skills to be an effective caregiver is important. And then some use humor, like this woman that said, we Southerners pass down guilt and regret like pound cake recipes. Next slide. I think the principles or assumptions if we're going to be care managers or social workers like I am is to recognize first and foremost that family care will affect all relationships within the family. It is rarely fair and equal. Many families see no choice and it will disrupt their lives. Next slide. What families can expect is that they're going to have to organize daily and adapt work schedules. They're going to have to find, ask for, and use help from others in the family as well as strangers that they may never have had to do before. They're going to have to make, carry out, and live with the consequences of decisions. And I think the care manager's role in helping families with decision making is probably the most important particularly because there's often resistance from the person who becomes less aware of his or her impairment. I think dealing with relationship changes and imbalances in the normal family give and take is also a major issue care managers or social workers face, and helping families deal with inevitable resentment, disappointed expectations of themselves, the person, and the service system and the uncertainty of knowing what will come next. Next slide. So what do families have to do? They have to negotiate complex and changing situations, as Rob pointed out, 
Often they have to do something very difficult for opposite sex adult children caring for a parent. They have to provide physically intimate care that they're not used to providing or medically complex care that they may not be adequately trained to provide. They have to deal with their own emotions. They have to deal with changes in behavior of the person. And they have to learn how to communicate differently with family members, the person, and the, the professionals that care for the person. They have to modify their expectations of themselves. Many people have to lower their standards for perfectionism particularly, and their expectations of the person in the service system, all the while capitalizing on the preserved capacities of the person with dementia. The next slide. Part of decision-making that's so hard for some families is balancing competing loyalties and commitments and needs for autonomy. Whose needs? Often I'm dealing with a couple who are, have degenerative chronic illnesses or are dementing at different rates from different conditions at the same time. And many families are dealing with in-laws, spouses, and parents at the same time. How long can we do this or how long can we afford to have somebody help us with this? How much can we do or how much can we afford? And the critical question is how do we evaluate the risk to ourselves, to our impaired relative, and the cost and benefit, personal and financial costs to all? Next slide. The major decision points after a diagnosis or and when families come to care managers for help is when there are changes in handling money, dealing with alcohol, driving, travel, or medications, when there are changes in safety, often when families notice fraud, neglect, people getting lost, falling, exploitation, or making a decision about when someone can no longer safely live alone. Many families call us about changes when they need to interact with the healthcare system, with HIPAA, for, you know, on behalf of their relative and sometimes without approval from their relative. And many families call us when there is resistance on the part of the person to change or using services or making moves or when there's illness, injury, or change in a family caregiver. Next slide. Preparing families for tough decisions, this is what I actually say to families. New problems aren't necessarily related to what you do or don't do. The person is unhappy because she is living with unwanted dependency. We have to start from that basis. It's all, we also have to assume it's easy for long distance relatives to second guess or criticize from a distance to remind families that they are going to have doubts, that they're inevitable, but doing nothing, taking no action may be more risky, and you can't possibly know what she would have done if your roles were reversed. But it is common for people with dementia to take out frustration on those closest to them. Next slide. The decision-making hazards for many families is that they are dealing with unrelenting or serial crises as people injure themselves when they can't adequately care for their health needs. Um, and many families find that they become bad decision makers when they don't have time to step back and get perspective. And that's why a social worker or care manager can be so important. Many families are also dealing with old promises. I'll, never make you leave your own home. And finally, they're chasing the ghost of the person as he or she once was. That's the family that tells you, oh yes, I'd be happy to consider adult day program for my dad as soon as he says he would love to go to one. Um, families are also dealing with conflicting perceptions or expectations. I worked with one husband who insisted he didn't need any paid help with his wife because she had daughters for that. Um, families are also concerned in making decisions about control issues. I am not turning my mom over to some agency. And often we have to remind families 
We're asking them to choose between equally unattractive options. Next slide. Early stage families need explanations to relate the brain changes to what they may see as willful or manipulative behavior on the part of the person. They don't understand why the person withdraws or loses interest or can't start things or has a shorter fuse, greater irritability, or why he's afraid to go anywhere that he used to go regularly, or why she can't follow the reminders even though she can read them, or why he goes to the bank every day but the bank is complaining or the pharmacy is complaining or why it takes her an hour to get to a beauty shop that's a couple of blocks away and why that may be an indication of a real safety concern or why you know he messes up minor repairs but won't let anyone else help. So families need help in going through those questions that are most important to them. Next, next slide. In moderate stage, families need explanations for some of the behaviors Rob talked about, but most of all, they need help on understanding why the person is likely to reject help or not recognize that they need help when their clearest memory is, I'm an adult and I shower every day and why is my daughter asking me about this? Um, many people also has a, have obsessive or perseverative behaviors where they purchase the same things over and over again or they take vitamins thinking it's going to make them feel better or they're constantly checking or searching or shadowing the person, not letting the family member out of their sight or they may make up stories to fill in blanks in their memory, often called confabulations. Rob talked about hallucinations, delusions of that involve suspiciousness, theft, or infidelity are very common. And there are also the visual cha spatial changes or ataxia that Rob mentioned that cause changes in falls, balance, and injury. Next slide. There are real safety concerns. What I focus on with families is the financial protections early and the driving considerations very early and the medication management. And medication is more than prescribed medication. It includes OTCs or over-the-counter medicine or toxins that may be misperceived by a person with dementia and taken incorrectly. Uh, but many families assume that a person who used to manage their own medications can still do so when they really can't. Uh, I always talk to families about guns power tools and potential safety risks in the kitchen or in the bathroom. I remind them about various programs for people who become lost. And we often talk about monitoring in terms of there's low-tech monitoring, there's discrete supervision or high-tech supervision that can be provided by GPS devices. Next slide. Many families will try to keep a but they want to know when it's safe not to leave them alone anymore. And many families will bring in or send in help and not recognize that the person doesn't understand they need help and they'll fire anyone on the spot. So these are some of the questions I ask, I give families to help them make the decision about when it's safe for persons to no longer live alone and probably the last one is the most important, available discrete surveillance. If there are other neighbors or people checking in regularly, some people are able to stay in a familiar environment for a while. Next slide. We want to remind, we want to, we want to be aware that families may be very resistant to use of community services that Rob talked about because of urban legends like people in home care steal from you or they just talk on their cell phones and don't pay any attention to the person. They may be concerned about costs or preserving assets, saving for a rainy day. They may have, you have denial about how much help is needed. They may fear loss of control to strangers 
and they may be overwhelmed by the disclosure required of private issues in an assessment. Next slide. So how can care managers help? I think they can give family and person-centered information, assessment and planning, recognizing, as Rob pointed out, that you need to update goals and priorities. You need to offer decisional support and acknowledgement for what they've already done to try to solve the problem or respond to their relatives' needs. We need reminders for families that they can't be perfect all the time and that there is an uncertainty and unpredictability in living with dementia. We need to help them with their feelings of failure or guilt or grief, particularly grief, which is often unacknowledged, their sadness as they lose pieces of the person as they knew them, and we need, they need a fresh perspective from us and help in appraising their options and teaching them problem-solving skills. Next slide. What families need and preferred, prefer is reliable, current, and trusted continuing sources of information and help with symptom management um, this is a new project that will be available later, Alzheimer's Medical Advisor. Help navigating the health and social service system in, on behalf of their relative, and criteria for evaluating the quality, cost, and benefits of services. Next slide. Uh, these are just some common questions families may ask care managers. I don't have real time to go over those. Next slide. There are a number of evidence-informed family interventions that may help families, and um, all of these you can get more information about later. I would just tell you that support groups and respite can be really effective, though so there's less evidence available about them. Next slide. What we know about respite is the most preferred, least available, and least affordable. But if you're going to measure use and outcomes, you've got to look at timing of that respite, dosing, how much, the frequency, intensity, flexibility, and most of all, the quality. Next slide. In summary, I think we have to listen and assess before we plan and recommend. We have to make no assumptions because, in my experience, culture and understanding cultural acceptability will trump all decision making. Offer families something to do, more than one option. Don't underestimate the power of the telephone conversation, email, or hard copy for them to take home. Prepare them for the fact that they'll change their minds. Offer previews with no commitment and offer quality services recognizing they are interested in reducing the individual's suffering and giving them certain benefits. Next slide. The next two slides are resources available to assist families in caring for their relatives, and they're available for your use later. And now I'd like to turn it over to Deborah Cherry. Thank you, Lisa. So I am Deborah Cherry, Executive Vice President at Alzheimer's Greater Los Angeles, and I'm here today to speak to you about some of the uh, challenges we've encountered in our efforts to create more dementia-capable healthcare systems within the state of California's dual eligibles pilot program, which is called CalMedi Connect. I also want to share with you some of the tools and strategies we've used to overcome these challenges um, and offer these to you um, with the hope that you'll adopt some of them. Um, next slide, please. The funding for this project was provided, that I'm describing, was provided by the U.S. Administration on Community Living. Next slide. Next slide, please. Next. Um, Deborah, you did cut out for just a minute there on the last slide, so um, if you could just make sure that you have a clear line for your, um, for your phone, that'd be great. Sure. This project was supported in part by the Administration for Community Living. 
the Dementia Cal Medi Connect project had five or has five components, and um, I'd like to review them for you because I think there are um, activities in each that. Um, champions both within the plans and within community-based um, organizations can easily adopt. The first is advocacy, and advocacy is a great deal like the provision of technical assistance. Um, we get created key advocacy statements such as 50% um, of people get a diagnosis, and even and half of those get it in their charts, or families are the backbone of the long-term care delivery system, or people with dementia are expensive for healthcare systems to treat. And then we work with um, health plans and healthcare organizations on how to address these issues. And we bring these issues up at stakeholder meetings and advisory committees and teach them to champions within the plans so that they say them there as well. This project also offered care manager training, both in person and monthly case conferences for um, care managers in the health plans. It offered caregiver education and respite to dual eligibles within CalMedi Connect, and we've done our best to encourage direct um, connection to Alzheimer's organizations in our state, um, sometimes through something called Al's Direct Connect, a, a confidential um, referral system that can be done electronically. Next slide, please. Here's a slide that we used and um, is part of our advocacy. It's the business case or part of a business case that can be made to healthcare organizations to help them improve, to motivate them to improve and better coordinate care for people with dementia. It shows that people um, with Medicare who have dementia have three times the cost um, to Medicare um, than other enrollees, and that these enrollees cost Medicaid 19 times more than the care for other Medicare enrollees. And this is um, driven, the latter is driven primarily by nursing home stays, the Medicare costs primarily by um, hospital stays. We found that health plans involved in the duals pilots were very concerned about these costs and also about the quality of care they wanted to deliver to this population. And so they were very eager at, to open the door to us. Next slide, please. To date, we have trained almost 300 care managers in eight health plans across our state. We have also, and that, that training is an eight hour training for care managers who are mostly nurses, sometimes social workers and other professionals. In addition, because in the three-way contract between our state, CMS, and each health plan, there is a requirement for a dementia care specialist at the health plan level. We have been training, um, we have trained to date about 44 of these dementia care specialists. They get an additional 12 hours of training face to face. Um, and both groups of, of care managers and dementia care specialists participate in six months of case conferences where they can um, hone their skills. Next slide, please. All of the materials that we use, or most of the materials that we use in this training is available at our website, and you can download it um, for free, including the screening tools we use, the caregiver education tools, um, strategies, lower literacy materials and strategies for working with challenging behavioral symptoms, um, and standardized care plans. We hope you'll download them and use them. Next slide, please. So as we worked with the health plans, we identified a number of challenges, and my guess is that you will encounter them as well within your systems or within the systems with whom you want to work. Um, one of them was a challenge to the recognition of dementia. As I mentioned earlier, we know that only about 50% of people with dementia ever get a formal diagnosis, and about half of these have it, um, ever have it documented in their charts. This number may be higher for the duals. Um, we found um, in our, some of our health plans that they were using health risk assessments that assessed for mental illness um, and were not actually assessing or screening for um, cognitive impairment. 
these were the health risk assessments were also really difficult to administer. It's very hard to reach many of the duels, and um, families of the duels seem to be less likely um, than other groups to bring dementia to the attention of the physician. And perhaps this is because many ethnic groups see dementia as a normal part of aging, and they only seek medical help when there are behavioral dis disturbances. For duels who come, have poor families coping with acculturation, multiple low-paying jobs, inadequate housing, and other concerns, this condition may not be their priority. They may see it as a normal part of aging. And then even if they do see physicians from their own um, cultural communities, those physicians um, of the same cultural background may share their cultural view that dementia is shameful or um, futile to identify. Next slide, please. So how can you better promote detection of patients with dementia? Um, and one is take a look at your health risk assessment content. Um, see if you are absolute, actually um, assessing for cognitive impairment. Um, encourage the adoption within um, medical practice or care manager practice, the adoption of a validated screening tool. We use the AD8 because in California most care management is done by phone, but there are many other validated screening tools that can be adopted. We train care managers to screen for dementia using this tool, and we encourage the plan to develop a, a follow-up protocol um, so that if someone screens positive, there is a referral made. Generally, it is to a primary care provider. Next slide, please. There's also a great need within this population to monitor for safety issues. There are families, uh, many families who don't understand the disease and don't supervise medications um, adequately. As an example, we had one um, Latino family with a diagnosed grandmother who'd been relied upon to bring grandchildren to school and administer her own meds. Over time, medication mistakes were being made and the children weren't being picked up at school. Obviously not an optimal situation, and it required some disease education. Next slide, please. A second major challenge that we've encountered is the challenge um, to identifying and engaging family caregivers. As we mentioned earlier, as I mentioned earlier, families are the backbone of our long-term care support system in this country. They provide 80% of community care um, to people with dementia. If the family lacks disease education and support, they will mismanage care and they will likely burn out. So this can result in premature nursing home placement or ER visits, and um, it's not in the interest of the family or the healthcare organization for this to be the case. So medical organizations may not be prepared yet to identify families, and if they don't, they get all of the signs shown on the slide, poor management of comorbid positions, noncompliance, behavior symptom, mismanagement, and more. Next slide, please. Within the duels um, pilot, um, there are um, some, there is a great deal of ethnic diversity. There is a lot more challenge than usual in discovering who is the actual caregiver. Caregiving in many cultures is not dyadic and the decision maker may not be apparent. Um, one example might be a Mexican-American family with a daughter who provides all the care at home, another daughter who goes to all the medical appointments. So there was an assumption that the healthcare decisions could be made by the daughter who came to the office. But actually in this family, the eldest son was the ultimate decision maker and no decisions could be made without him. Next slide, please. In order to recognize and partner with um, the family, um, we teach care managers to identify the caregiver, and we provide um, a caregiver identification tool which is available on our website. We teach them to um, do an assessment of the family caregiver's needs, 
um, a tool also is available um, to assess how stressed that caregiver is. And we've been using the Benjamin Rose Institute's Caregiver Strain in Index, which is also on the website. And then we provide the care managers with standardized care plans. These were developed from an evidence-based program called ACCESS um, that help the care managers think about how to do follow-up within the medical system and with community-based organizations. They also reference uh, materials that can be shared with people, with families that they're working with, so that um, lower literacy families can get education and support. Next slide, please. As many of you are aware, um, materials for um, in participants in our national financial realignment, which we call the dual eligibles pilot, um, have to be delivered at a sixth grade or lower educational level. Not everyone in the in the pilots is at that level, but the materials are best at, created at that level for the majority of participants. And um, there are very few of these materials available nationwide um, for um, for existing use. So one of the, um, as the care managers develop a closer relationship with a family caregiver and provide them with education um, about the disease, um, they may want to return to some of the plain language fact sheets we've been developing. Again, I'll show you a few of them, but they are available on the website um, so that they can use these to help the caregivers um, manage issues like hallucinations or home safety or getting lost. Um, we have six of these fact sheets so far and um, another four in the works right now. Um, and they are available currently in English and Spanish. And if you turn slowly through the next three slides, people can take a look at them. Here's one, keeping home safe, English on one side, Spanish on another, soon to be developed in Chinese, and the people who use them locally will have an opportunity to brand them with their own organization's brand. Next one, medications, um, what you can do to um, manage the medications of the person. Next one is bathing, some simple recommendations on um, how to helping the person with Alzheimer's disease um, bathe. And, um, these are just three of, of a number available on the website. So challenges to partnerships with community-based organizations um, exist. Um, there is a culture difference between large healthcare systems and most community-based organizations. Managed care organizations expect timeliness and feedback. Community-based organizations may not be HIPAA compliant, may not have the capacity to deal with quantities of referrals that they receive. The partners need to invest some time to see, um, to learn each other's cultures and services better. Um, and uh, there is a manual, again, on the website called Establishing Partnerships that describes how to create a partnership between a managed care organization and a community-based organization, and that may be helpful to you. Next slide. The benefits of partnerships with community-based organizations has been described um, previously, so I'm not going to go over them again. They're here on the slide. Um, both Alzheimer's Association, Alzheimer's other Alzheimer's organization like my own or AAAs can offer a variety of excellent services, mostly free to help families. And um, definitely they, we are your partners if you're a healthcare organization um, in providing care. Next slide. We do have preliminary um, data on um, six-month follow-ups with the care managers that asks them when working with a person, with a member who has Alzheimer's disease or related dementia, um, the first one, I usually encourage them to receive a formal diagnosis. But you can see that at baseline, 67% of these care managers were encouraging people to get a formal diagnosis. But after training, the regular care managers, 82% did the encouragement, and for the dementia care specialists, the preliminary data with 10 reporting, 90% encouraged a formal diagnosis. I usually determine whether they have an informal caregiver. 
that um, percentage has gone up from 63% encouraging to 75 and 90%. And I'm going to go down to the bottom of that slide where it says, I usually refer the caregiver to available home and community-based services. At baseline, only 54% of these care managers made referrals to community-based services home and community-based services, and it's gone up to 76% for the care managers in general, 100% for these dementia care specialists, and um, similar numbers for referrals to Alzheimer's organizations as a complement. Next slide, please. So if you're creating or trying to create a dementia-capable system of care, this is what you're going to try to put in place. You're going to try to put in place health risk assessments or other assessments that include cognitive impairment and identification of the caregiver. You want to adopt a validated screening tool. And if that tool is positive, you want the person referred for a diagnosis. You want to identify family, friend, caregivers, assess them. Um, we have standardized care plans that might be worth adopting. Definitely want to adopt caregiver education and support because they're your partners in providing care. And strongly recommend partnerships with community-based organizations. Again, um, all these materials on our website. And I'd like to go to the final slide where I recognize my teammates and especially my co-director, Laura Connolly, the program manager, Jennifer Schlesinger, and Dr. Brooke Collister, our project evaluator. Thank you. Let me turn it over now to Renee. Thanks so much, oh. Deborah. Um, was someone going to jump in? <laughs> Hi, Renee. This is Jesse. I was just going to give some announcements before we get to the Q and A. Okay. Um, you know what? I was going to turn it over to you in just a second. I just wanted to say <laughs> okay, thank you ahead. from my perspective, from uh, uh, to, to both to Deborah and also to uh, to Rob and to Lisa. You know, these these were incredibly detailed and informative presentations on really challenging but critical uh, topics. Um, but I especially wanted to uh, express some appreciation for uh, how interdisciplinary these experts are um, in approaching how to prepare patients and caregivers um, after a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or related dementias. So um, I know that uh, Jesse wants to explain how to ask questions, so I'm going to turn it back over to her so she can explain that and then moderate the question and answer session. Jesse. Great. Thank you, Renee. And yes, thank you, Deborah, Lisa, and Rob for your presentation. They were incredibly informative and we're really lucky to have you on today for this presentation. Um, so at this time, if you have any questions for our speakers, we do encourage you to put them in the Q&A function on the WebEx chat. And just before we get to those questions that have already come in, I did want to give a brief announcement regarding the CME and CE credits. Uh, there is a post-test and evaluation that all those who wish to receive credits must complete. Um, this will actually appear in a new browser window once we finish the event. So after the Q&A, once we shut down the WebEx, there'll be a new browser window that pops up on your screen that will have both the post-test questions and the evaluation. Um, you must receive 80% on the post-test questions, and um, you must also complete all of the evaluation questions before clicking Submit. If you're not seeking any credit today, we do encourage you to also complete the evaluation when it appears on your screen. And finally, all, um, all of the today's slides from the presentation and a recording of this presentation will be available on our website. That's at www.resourcesforintegratedcare.com. And an email will be sent to all participants um, who are on the presentation today with um, that additional information. So now I have um, a question here uh, from our audience. And um, the question is, can you speak a little more about different ethnic groups um, seeing dementia as a normal part of aging? So um, Deborah Cherry, I think that question might relate a little bit to what you were speaking about, but feel free to hand it off to a different um, speaker if you prefer. I'd be happy to, um, to start addressing it. Um, you know, as when I took, became a psychologist, people were still viewing um, Alzheimer's and the related dementias as a normal part of aging. They called it senility, um, then became senile dementia. 
Um, and then we differentiated between Alzheimer's and vascular dementia and other forms of dementia. Well, many people who come from other countries um, haven't um, progressed in, the, in their knowledge. Some countries certainly have and are far ahead of us, but many have not progressed in their level of knowledge about these diseases and view them with um, some stigma as a normal part of aging or as craziness. Um, and in some cultures, there is a great deal of shame, which actually happens in our culture as well, a lot of stigma attached to these diseases, but in some cultures, even more shame, um, the families seek to hide the disease. Um, sometimes to great detriment, one example, a Chinese family who hid the disease and the mom actually um, set fire to the daughter's home and went switched it over to the son's home, um, still hiding the disease until the mother left home in her bedroom slippers walking 10 miles across Los Angeles and was happily rescued un unhurt. But it was at that point that the grandchildren insisted that they get um, a diagnostic workup and some help. So stigma can be great, and it just varies by culture, it varies by acculturation, and it varies by educational level. That's great. all I have Thanks, to say. Deborah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that was, that was great. Um, I have a question that came in here for Dr. Schreiber. Um, typically, how long does a person try the medication before deciding whether or not it's helping? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, um, depending on the you know the phase of the disease or the stage of the disease, oftentimes we will try for anywhere from a good three to six months. Um, and based on uh, what we also try to do is understand how we're going to measure success. What does success look like? Um, oftentimes there will be other interventions. You know, we talked about the impact of the caregiver and how important that is. And so as we're doing multiple changes, it's really important to try to understand what's making the impact because if you're doing socialization, you're having caregiver support, so they become better at managing the uh, challenges that their loved one is presenting, that may actually be the intervention that's making more of a difference in terms of the behavioral outcomes, the sleep, and the socialization, et cetera. So it's hard to sometimes know that, but generally speaking, we try to pick, um, you know, where are people in terms of socialization, activity, their mood, um, you know, whether they're irritable, um, are they more uh, active in terms of doing things, more engaged with families, and then we will usually give it at least six months um, time, assuming that they're not having side effects, et cetera. And that is another problem is we're adding medications oftentimes to people who often will have multiple comorbidities. And so if you're going to be adding medications which have potential side effects and burdens and can add and uh, you know, add on to the um, number of uh, medications they have and cause side effects, it's oftentimes important to maybe try to look at the medications first, see what can be removed before you add something else. And also make certain that there's not medication side effects that are causing some of these behaviors as well, so, or some of the challenges. But um, that's usually what we do. There are actually um, some guidelines that have been proposed, but again, if there does not appear to be benefits in spite of all the engagement of the family and, you know, they're, you're pretty confident that, um, you know, you're doing everything that you can be doing, then oftentimes I will stop the medications uh, because, again, there is no evidence uh, that, um, you know, they're going to mitigate or prevent the progression of the disease. Great. Thank you, Dr. Schreiber. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so we have a question here that is generally for all presenters, so um, maybe, Dr. Guaido, you could step in first here. Do any of the presenters have recommendations on how to create an advanced directive after the diagnosis has occurred? I know I received many questions from caregivers on how to create this, especially if the person changes their mind daily on what they're saying they would like to happen for end-of-life planning. I could start that. I mean, I think the most important thing to get across to caregivers is that if the person is interested in an advanced directive, and they should be, the first thing they should consider is a surrogate decision maker. 
and even before advanced directives, people will change their minds about what they may or may want, may not want. But everyone needs help in making decisions and needs to identify who they trust to help make those decisions. So I try and get the conversation around to issues of a healthcare surrogate or a financial surrogate and durable powers of attorney for both before I talk about advanced directives. I think it is important to listen to the person early in the course of the disease about what's most important to them and what their goals are, as Rob pointed out. But actually going down to specific procedures that they may or may not want may change with time. And that's why it's important to have the surrogate before the specifics. This is Rob. I just wanted to mm -hmm. add, uh, just add on to what um, Lisa mentioned. So I, I totally concur with that. It's really important to have a proxy or surrogate um, appointed and somebody that um, knows the individual. And I think, you know, in terms of the goals and values, um, people's goals can change, but oftentimes their values, what's important to them, how they live their life, you know, um, what, what their principles are, oftentimes don't change even as diseases progress or people age. So understanding really how people want to live and what's important to them versus how do they not want to live um, is oftentimes a good way to get to the values of individuals. And there are tools out there, something called the Conversation Project is one that's being used fairly widely that really focuses on individuals' values and goals and can be utilized to help have an ongoing conversation. It is not um, uncommon for people, you know, to change their minds because there's no way to understand all the possible advanced directive situations you can potentially find yourselves in. But what doesn't usually change in values, so if you have a surrogate and those values are understood and the individual is unable to make decisions at that time where there may be a critical illness or a process going on, then you do have guidance and the opportunity of understanding what that individual would want based on their values. And I think that's really the important thing. And this is why that trust and relationship and having the interdisciplinary team, those care managers and resources and education and information, having open, honest dialogue as the disease progresses is really critically important because people will migrate based on their values what they do and do not want. This is Lisa. I just want to support Rob's referral to the Conversation Project. That's the most useful for families and individuals with dementia at this point. Great. Thank you both. Um, Deborah, I have a question here that maybe you could start off. Could a panelist talk about the dignity of risk and how sometimes people are shuttled off to an institution for their safety? Too much safety can sometimes mean taking away all choices from the diagnosed person. So I think that there is always a balance between the issue of safety and the issue of autonomy. And, um, you know, I believe that, um, that the, in the dual eligibles pilot, there is definitely a reluctance to institutionalize um, individuals um, before they absolutely need it. Um, and there are, um, and most families, um, you know, who are providing the care are struggling with this issue. Um, families, families want their relative to be safe but they also don't want their relatives to burn down the house. And so I don't think that there's an easy answer. I do think that um, people can speak with representatives of different Alzheimer's organizations, either at universities, such as Lisa's, or Alzheimer's organizations like mine, um, and speak with a, a, a social worker or a care counselor who can help them work out what is the right balance at this point for their relative. 
Um, and sometimes there are simple interventions you can take, like a, you know, the medic alert bracelet helping people to be returned safely um, can sometimes allow someone a bit more, um, you know, a bit more freedom um, in their community. Um, so there can be some simple interventions and some simple uh, adjustments that can be made to the home that maximize the individual's autonomy um, while keeping them safe. Great, thank you, Dr. Cherry. Um, I have another question here um, that says, I've worked with a lovely lady with dementia as well as moderate MR and Down syndrome before in a group home. I was wondering if the panelists could touch a little on how they've seen um, the prognosis of dementia progress with a condition, condition such as this. Um, Dr. Schweiker, Dr. Schreider, could either of you touch on this? Rob should take that one. Yeah, yeah. And so actually, I, I, thanks, Lisa. Um, <laughs> actually, I have several um, uh, patients that I do um, uh, co-management with who have Down syndrome and that live in um, group homes and are progressing with dementia. Um, and what's been really interesting about this is that um, the, the caregivers and family, one of the critical things is, again, we do have a natural interdisciplinary team there, right? I mean, we have the, the caregivers who really know these individuals well, their preferences and goals. And so as a result of understanding their wishes, and you know, this gets to the comments that Deborah was talking about, the autonomy of you know, giving people autonomy but also trying to do the right thing, understanding really what these individuals want, how they want to live, what gives them pleasure. You know, is it more about longevity or is it about quality of life and function? And I have found that by working with the uh, caregivers, working with the family so they understand the you know, diagnosis, you know, we're assessing how the disease is progressing, we've been able to really create care plans that are based on what the individual wants, you know, what their goals are, what gives them pleasure, what gives them joy, and can keep them in their home setting even as the disease progresses, even to the point of oftentimes bringing in hospice rather than putting them into a institutional setting. And so I have about four people I'm following now, two of which have severe um, uh, and advancing, you know, end-stage Alzheimer's, and we've been able, one of them is now on hospice, but the goal and their quality of life and what mattered most was really being able to be in their home with their friends and their quote unquote family. So I think, you know, we see this happen um, and it can, this, what applies in the communities with appropriate supports can actually occur with this population as well. If I may add to um, this, Deborah, adding to what Rob said, we are also doing a, a statewide demonstration in this area, and I'd like to refer people to a website, um, the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry, AADMD.org. There is a national task group on intellectual disabilities and dementia practices, and a lot of really valuable information is posted there. Um, and just in a very simple sentence, let me say that in general, we have found that people want to age in place. They don't want to join um, nursing homes that are for um, that are from outside of their community. And so there's a lot of need to develop services as this generation of people with intellectual disabilities is living longer than ever before and developing high rates of dementia. But and the National Task Group on Intellectual Disabilities and Dementia Practices, really worthwhile looking at their work, NTG. And one other thing, just in terms of what Deborah was talking about, you know, we talked about community-based organizations, area agencies on aging. I mean, those um, organizations can actually bring in resources as well to this population. So as we're thinking about, you know, the care team and brought in that interdisciplinary team, you know, look at what exists in the community because there are organizations that can help further what that individual's goals are. Great, thank you. And um, for all those resources that you mentioned, Deborah, we'll follow up and um, for all the participants, we'll make sure to put those on our website so you can have access to them. Um, so I think we have time for just one more question. Um, 
And Dr. Greider, maybe we could start with you on this and feel free to pass it off um, before we completely wrap up here. Um, so the question is, can a person have the diagnosis of dementia and a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease at the same time? Because that's what I see a lot of when I review medical charts. Also, I see that one year a person will have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, and during the next annual, um, the doctor will put dementia, and it goes back and forth. So how important is it to really differentiate the diagnosis? That's the most common question that families ask as well as as physicians, um, dementia is a broad term, and there are many causes of dementia. Dementia is a broad descriptive term that describes a number of symptoms that are seen together. Alzheimer's is the most common cause of dementia. Many families mistakenly believe that if the doctor says dementia, it's somehow milder or normal and not as serious as Alzheimer's disease. And so I think it's very important for us to let families know that dementia is a descriptive term and that Alzheimer's is the most common cause of dementia, but there are other causes of dementia. And we're increasingly learning that many times people have mixed forms of dementia, like vascular and Alzheimer's disease, Sometimes they have frontal temporal de degeneration in Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body dementia, and Alzheimer's disease. But the specificity of the diagnosis may be very important in the available treatment options. Uh, but in general, dementia is a broad, inclusive term that doesn't relate to a specific cause. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Schreiber, Dr. Cherry, would anyone like to join in on that last question? Well, Lisa knocked it out of the park. <laughs> she, 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 it's, it, it is, um, it's a very common question. It is a, the most common question. And oftentimes, it, it, the, the reason to know the type of dementia, it can actually, there are risk factors that can be mitigated if it's a vascular dementia. There are medications that you may or may not want to use if it's like a Lewy body dementia. But in terms of the general approach, it's really very similar um, in terms of the way we manage the individual and the, you know, the uh, caregivers and the environment. So, um, but it, 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 you do want to have specificity, and oftentimes I will give people that this probably is Alzheimer's, but there could be a vascular dementia, like a mixed dementia occurring, as, you know, Lisa mentioned. And so I think it's important to understand that because there are differences, uh, some differences in treatment depending on the type of dementia you have. Thank you. Um, all right, I want to leave some time for people to be able to complete the post-test. Um, so we did receive a lot of questions. Thank you all for your participation today. And um, the questions that we weren't able to address live during the Q&A now, we will be sending them off to the speakers so they can answer those. and the. Um, the answers to those will be posted on our website as well. That will be along with, as I said before, a recording of this webinar and these slides as well. Um, so thank you, Dr. Schreiber, Gweiser, and Cherry. Again, this was a wonderful presentation. Thank you all for your commitment to, to um, this cause and to um, the education aspect of it, too. It's great to have um, this available for everyone across the country. You're very welcome. Uh, Thank you. Great. So just as a reminder, if you're seeking CME or CE credit, the post-test and evaluation questions will appear in a new browser window once this event ends. And if you have any questions or comments, please email ric at lewin.com. As you can see on the slide now, uh, we do have an, a new webinar coming up on July 19th that will focus on care transitions to and from the hospital for individuals with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, and we'll be sure to get you the registration link for that as soon as possible. Thank you all again for your participation, participation today, and have a wonderful afternoon.